welcome to English Grammar on Film in 45 Minutes. Would you want a doctor who has no knowledge of anatomy or biology, about the structure and inner workings of the body? Of course not. And if it is essential for the doctor to know all about the component parts of the body and how they work together, Shouldn't we expect speakers of English to know how the language is made up and why it works as it does and what makes it healthy or diseased? What anatomy and biology are to doctors, grammar and syntax are to speakers and writers of English. Grammar used to be taught in all schools, but this has been largely abandoned in the last generation, with the result that we have seen in this country a depressing and dangerous decline in communication skills, both in speech and writing. It is shocking that young adults can come out of school after so many years of compulsory education, whether free or paid for, almost inarticulate. It is as though a generation of musicians had given up learning the rules of music and knew nothing about harmony or pitch or different keys or the terms sharp and flat or sought to compose without being taught counterpoint. And while there are of course people with exceptional gifts who can play anything by ear without having studied music, they are very few, and even the best of them are unlikely to play perfectly, without mistakes. Happily, there are at last signs of a very welcome and very overdue revival of interest in learning grammar. A book called Gwynne's Grammar, which gives a very thorough and accurate study of the subject, actually became something of a bestseller in 2013. But it is not easy to confront all this information cold in a rather austere textbook, however good. Learning is much easier if you are taught rather than having to teach yourself. And while we cannot, of course, give you a complete survey of English grammar in 45 minutes of film tuition, we can give you the basics in an easily digestible form and whet your appetite to learn more. At the same time, we have to say that knowledge of grammar is only one component in learning to be a good communicator in English. It is an important one, just as it is important for the doctor to learn anatomy and biology, for the musician to learn the rules of the language of music, or for the sportsman to learn the rules of his game. But once you have learnt these rules, you need to apply them, and that means practice. You can study all the books on grammar ever written, but you will never speak or write good English unless you immerse yourself in reading and hearing good English, well written and well spoken, and practice it. This is blindingly obvious in the cases of medicine, music and sport, and it should be equally obvious in the case of our language. But how could you get this practice? For writing skills, you can read good books, well written by good authors. But for speaking skills, it is more difficult. Even the BBC's supposedly quality channels can no longer be relied upon for good, clear, accurate and attractive English speech and pronunciation. Just listen to this example, which we have made up from mistakes heard in one day from BBC News reporters on its supposedly top quality radio channel, Radio 4.
this is the news. Harassed by the Birmingham protesters, neither of the two societies would voluntarily give a on-the-record estimate of the resources required for the next decade's food research projects without assuming a early end to the funding difficulties, recourse to a good secondary state subsidy and a total withdrawal of all the new regulatory restrictions that are now mandatory. Now, let's try that radio broadcast again and hear the sentence correctly pronounced as it would have been if that poor news reporter had done our English speech and pronunciation course. This is the news. Harassed by the Birmingham protesters, neither of the two societies would voluntarily give an on-the-record estimate of the resources required for the next decade's food research projects without assuming an early end to the funding difficulties, recourse to a good secondary state subsidy, and a total withdrawal of all the new regulatory restrictions that are now mandatory. That's much better. The English language is like fine wine. It needs and deserves to be served in a clear and beautiful glass, not a cracked cup, and it's not made more palatable by having nasty bits of gunk floating about in it much of it transatlantic in origin, turning it cloudy and sour. For students of English as a second language, it is particularly difficult to know if the tutors they go to in countless thousands of schools of English all over the world are any good. Many are barely comprehensible. And while there are some good language schools, a lot of them are a disgraceful racket. All this is why we have produced our unique, all on film, English speech and pronunciation course. With every word able to be read in a text while being presented to you by top British actors and tutors on nearly 20 hours of superb video. You can read, listen and see the whole of the language unfolding before you. Then. You practice, and at the end of it, the ability to speak good English well, with a good accent, and without embarrassing mistakes, will be second nature to you. So much so that you will be able to concentrate entirely on what you want to say, rather than how to say it. But for the present, Please mount up and join me in a 45-minute canter through the essentials of English grammar and learn about the parts of speech. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns, prepositions and so forth that make up the anatomy of our wonderful language. Then we'll say more about the practice and how we can turn you into a brilliant doctor of English communication. What exactly do grammar and syntax mean? Well, both words come from Greek. Grammar refers to writing sounds down. It's from the same root as telegram, uh, which means writing at a distance. Gram being writing and tele meaning far off or at a distance, as in television, which is vision at a distance. It's the study of words or parts of speech nouns, verbs, and so forth, and how they are used in different positions in a sentence as subjects, objects, and so on. Syntax, a lovely word to pronounce, means the study of how the words are put together. It's also from Greek, the prefix syn, meaning with or together, as in synthesis, a putting together, or sympathy, a fellow feeling with someone, and tax, uh, which is nothing to do with paying governments to waste your money, but comes from the Greek word for arranging or putting in place, as in the science of taxonomy, 
which is the classification of things. Plants or animals or geological specimens or chemical elements or anything at all. It is, in fact, the essential principle that lies behind all science and knowledge. Syntax is the science of putting together words, clauses, sentences and paragraphs. If you go to a shop and buy a flat pack of pieces of wood and screws and hinges and all the other things needed to make a piece of furniture, say a cabinet, studying all the different bits and naming them is the grammar and knowing how to put them together to make the finished cabinet that will be serviceable and attractive is the syntax. Let's start with nouns. The word noun comes from the Latin word nomen. which gave us indirectly our words noun and name, a noun being the type of word that gives us the name of a person or thing. The nouns man, tutor, Peter, are all nouns defining me. Man and tutor are called common nouns because they are common or generally meaning. I belong to the class of creature known as men, and tutors, while Peter is a proper noun because it is the name that belongs to me personally and distinguishes me from other men and tutors. The original meaning of the word proper is belonging. Your property is what belongs to you and proper has come to mean something that should belong to someone or something as when we talk of the proper or appropriate way of doing something. Then there are pronouns, words that stand for pro a noun. If instead of saying Peter is a tutor, we say he is a tutor, the word he is the pronoun standing for and referring to the proper noun Peter. And there are different kinds of pronouns. I, you, he, she and it, we, you the plural, and they are personal pronouns, referring to specific people or, in the case of it, and sometimes they, things. But there are also interrogative pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, relative pronouns, and possessive pronouns. Here are some examples in two little sentences. The first asking a question, the second giving the answer. Who is that? She's Jane, who is a teacher and our tutor. The interrogative pronoun asks a question. It wants to know who or what someone or something is. It is a pronoun asking to be told the noun which we want to discover, which in this case is the name of that person over there. Who is that? And that, like this, is a demonstrative pronoun, demonstrating or indicating which person or thing is meant. Not this one here, that one over there. In the answer to the question, we have the personal pronoun she, referring to that person. And we have the relative pronoun who, beginning the subclause and referring to the proper noun Jane. We could have used two sentences instead of one in our reply to the question and said, she is Jane, she is a teacher and our tutor. But instead, we made the second sentence into a relative clause, relating to the first and introduced by the relative pronoun who, relating back to Jane. So then, we have nouns and pronouns in our little question and answer sentences. The nouns are teacher and tutor, common nouns, and Jane, a proper noun. The pronouns, the words standing for nouns, are the first who, an interrogative pronoun, that, a demonstrative pronoun, 
she, a personal pronoun, the second who, a relative pronoun, and a, a possessive pronoun. The possessive pronoun tells you to whom or to what a noun belongs. Listen to all these examples in one sentence. My wife and your daughter went to their house in her car, whose colour was its worst feature. And note that whose is a possessive relative pronoun relating to the noun car. It means of which, and we could have said the colour of which was its worst feature. The word whose can also be used as a possessive interrogative pronoun, as when we ask, for example, whose is that? Many people fail to understand the difference between its which is the colloquial abbreviation of it is and has a little comma in the air called an apostrophe indicating the missing letter I and its the possessive pronoun meaning of it and having no apostrophe because it has no missing letter. It has simply changed its form as he changes to his and she changes to her. Going back now to our little question and answer sentences, what other words did we have in them? We had the word and, which is called a conjunction. Logically enough, as it joins two words or phrases or clauses together, com. Jane is a teacher and our tutor. Here it is joining two nouns, teacher and tutor. But it could also join two sentences so that they become equal clauses of one longer sentence. She is Jane, and she is a teacher. And where a contrast is required, the conjunction is but. In the sentence, he is nice, but stupid, the conjunction but is joining two contrasting adjectives. It can also, like and, join two clauses, as in, they are all nice, but John is the nicest. The family of conjunctions is a large one, including because, as, although, and since, to mention just a very few. We also had in our little sentences the shortest, and one of the commonest, and most commonly mispronounced of all words in English, a, uh, the indefinite article. Jane is a tutor. It is called the indefinite article because it does not define a specific person or thing. She is a tutor, one of a class of people or things. If we had said, she is the tutor for English pronunciation, or she is the best tutor, we should have been defining her personally, not just generally as one of the indefinite class of creatures known as tutors, but as a special definite one. She is not just a tutor, any old tutor, she is the tutor for English pronunciation, or the best tutor. The word the, which is also one of the commonest and most tiresomely mispronounced in English, is called the definite article. <laughs> You'll hear, he went to a play at the theatre. He didn't. He went to a play at the theatre. To lengthen the vowels in these little words is as illogical as it is unpleasant. It detracts from the words that are important, the nouns, play and theatre. But what is a vowel?
Let's pause for a moment and quickly run through the main classification of the letters of the alphabet, which is made up of vowels and consonants. The origin of the word vowel is the Latin vox, which has come into English as voice, and we more easily recognize its Latin origin than the word vocal. Vowels are sounded by using the vocal chords. The main ones are represented by the letters named A, E, I, O, and U, though the letter Y can act either as a vowel, as in fly, or as a consonant, as in yet. But what is a consonant? And why is it called that? The word consonant comes from Latin too. The prefix con means together with and sonant means sounding, the English word coming from the Latin one. It is a letter that cannot be sounded except with the help of, together with, con, a vowel. For example, you can say a vowel by itself, a long a or a short a or a but you can't say consonants without using a vowel sound. This is equally the case with the names of consonants and with the sounds, often many different ones, that they make when used in words. For example, when you say the names of the consonants B, C or T, you need the help of the long E vowel sound. To say the names of F, L, and S requires a short E vowel sound. The name of J needs a long A vowel sound. Q needs a U vowel sound, and so forth. And when these consonants are used in words, they all need vowels to help them make their sounds, unless, of course, they are silent, like the B in climb. Even to say the very basic sounds of the consonants b, f, j, and l, for example, requires a vowel sound, which in all these cases is what is called the indefinite vowel, the sound of a refined grunt that we hear, for example, in the indefinite article a, uh, the a in vital, the e in accent the O in bacon, and in many combinations of vowels like the I-O-N ending of vision, or the I-O-U-S ending of precious. But let's have a little quiz to test your knowledge of the names of the parts of speech we have looked at so far. Here are our little question and answer sentences again. Who is that? She's Jane, who is a teacher and our tutor. We're going to ask you some questions on the words we've looked at. And we'd like you to point to and say aloud the appropriate word or words. Then you can check if you've got them right as we highlight them on the screen. Which is the proper noun? Which are the common nouns? Which is the personal pronoun? Which is the relative pronoun? Which is the demonstrative pronoun? Which is the interrogative pronoun?
which is the indefinite article? Which is the possessive pronoun? Which is the conjunction? But there is one word in those little sentences that we haven't yet studied, the verb. And it's the most vital of all the parts of speech because you cannot make a sentence without one. The verb in both those sentences is the word is. It is the third person singular of the present tense of the verb to be. And it is one of the relatively few cases of inflection in English. An inflection is a change in the form of the word according to its use in a sentence. Some languages, like Latin, are very highly inflected, but English isn't. Take, for example, the first verb you learn in Latin, amo, meaning I love. In the basic present tense it goes amo, amas, amat, amamus, amatis, amant. There's a jolly little poem that starts, A mow a mass, I love a lass, a cowslip tall and slender, but I mustn't digress. Now, compare the English equivalents. A mow, I love. A mass, you love. A mat, he, she, or it loves. A marmus, we love. A martis, you love. A mant, they love. With the exception of the third person singular form, loves. The form of the verb does not change in English as it does in Latin, which is a highly inflected language that shows the person, first, second and third, and number, singular or plural, by changing the form of the verb itself. English uses pronouns to show the persons and number. I and we for the first persons, singular and plural, he, she, or it for the third person singular of the three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter, they for the third person plural of all genders, and you for the second person, whether singular or plural. There used to be a different form for the singular, thou, but you will find it now only in old literature. I know thee who thou art. English, however, has more subtlety than Latin, and indeed than most other languages, in separating the simple and continuous forms of each tense. For example, I go, the simple form, and I am going, the continuous form. And this brings us back to the verb to be, which is used in compound verbs, as in those continuous present tense forms. I am going. You are going. He, she, or it is going. We are going. You are going. They are going. And let's look at other tenses. The basic ones are the present tense. It's happening right now. For example, she walks quickly. Or the continuous form, she is walking quickly. The future tense, she will walk quickly. Or the continuous form, she will be walking quickly. The past imperfect, or simply imperfect tense, she was walking quickly. It's called imperfect because the action has not yet finished. It is imperfect. The simple past tense, she walked quickly. The perfect tense, she has walked quickly. Or the continuous form, she has been walking quickly. Here the action of walking quickly has been completed or perfected. The future perfect tense, she will have walked quickly, or she will have been walking quickly. And the pluperfect or past perfect tense, she had walked quickly, or its continuous form, she had been walking quickly. Then there are the conditional tenses, as they are called, which often involve the words should and would. If only she would walk quickly, she would get home sooner. Verbs, as we said earlier, are the most vital words because you can't have a sentence without one, though you can technically have a sentence with only a verb. I had a terrifying headmaster at school. 
and when I had been naughty and was sent to the headmaster's study, I remember knocking timidly on the great oak door and waiting for the booming voice to say, Come! That one word is technically a sentence in itself. Well, not much of one admittedly, but it does qualify. The command, come, is known as the imperative mood of the verb. The word imperative meaning commanding, as in the words empire, emperor, imperial, which are from the Latin imperium and imperator. But what is a sentence? Where does the word come from? This too is from Latin, sententia, meaning an opinion, judgment or expression. In grammar, it means a group of words that together give complete expression to a single thought which you wish to convey, which could be a statement of fact or opinion, a question, a command or a request. And it always has a verb. Let's see how a typical simple sentence is made up. Jane loves John. The verb is loves, and it has a subject, Jane, the one who is performing the action of the verb, and an object, John, the one who is being loved, the lucky man who is the object of her affection. Now, that sentence has an active verb. Its subject is performing the action of the verb doing the loving. But let's put it the other way around to what is known as the passive voice of the verb. John is loved by Jane. The noun which was the object of the active verb in the first sentence, John, is now the subject of the passive verb. And why is it called passive? It comes from Latin again. The passive verb Patior, meaning I suffer. Suffer, that is, in its basic sense of undergo something, or be at the receiving end of an action rather than doing it. A patient in hospital has things done to him, and as they are mostly unpleasant things, he suffers in the usual unpleasant sense. And passive people are those who let things be said or done to them without reacting, without doing anything active. John, the subject, is not doing anything in this passive sentence. He is suffering, a lucky chap, the loving being done by Jane, and her role as agent is now expressed by a preposition, by. John is loved by Jane. What then is a preposition? It's a word that is positioned before pre a noun or pronoun to show the relationship between them. The prepositions are like links and cogs in the gearbox that directs the energy of the engine. The following sentence will show what I mean, all the prepositions being in italics. We live in the hope of getting into university after two years for doctoral studies by working hard at our English speech and pronunciation course. We also find prepositions used as prefixes in compound words, a prefix being something fixed to the front of the root of the word pre again. You've just had examples in the words prefix and preposition. And there are thousands of such compound words with prepositional prefixes, prefixes made with prepositions. Afterthought, connotation, cooperate, Export, import, income, outcome, perform, the verb perfect and the adjective perfect, precondition, pronoun, research, understand, to mention just a few. Sometimes a root word has two prepositional prefixes 
especially where the first is a negative prefix, as in indescribable or unendurable. And, of course, many prepositional prefixes were already in the words when they were adopted from other languages, especially Latin and Greek, as in comprehend, perfect, propel, repel, or symphony. English does not use the basic roots as words on their own in these cases, only the adopted compound forms. What else should we mention? Oh, adjectives and adverbs, of course. I knew we'd forgotten something important. Read and listen to this sentence. The most beautiful of our tutors, Jane, is very clever and always teaches clearly and very effectively. You will notice, incidentally, that I have not used the name of any of our lady tutors because I do not relish being in the invidious position of Paris, Prince of Troy, to whom the three goddesses appeared and demanded that he gave the golden apple to the most beautiful. The resulting Trojan War would be as nothing compared with the trouble I should get into, and besides, all our lady tutors are equally beautiful and clever. But back to the matter in hand. Adjectives and adverbs. The word adjective means literally something thrown or set against something else. In this case, a word that is set against a noun to describe it or qualify it. What sort of tutor is Jane? She is beautiful and clever. These are adjectives describing the proper noun Jane. Adjectives can be joined to their noun either directly, as in, she is a beautiful and clever tutor, or can come after the verb to be, as in, our tutor is beautiful and clever, in which case the adjectives are said to be the complement of the verb, because they complete the meaning, just as the complement of a ship means the sailors who fill up the total needed to operate it. But Jane is not just clever and beautiful, she is very clever and the most beautiful of the tutors. And she always teaches clearly and very effectively. All those words in bold are adverbs, words which are added to verbs, adjectives or other adverbs to qualify them in some way. It may sound odd to say that adverbs can be added to types of words other than verbs, but the term verb in the compound word adverb keeps the basic sense of its Latin original, verbum, meaning simply word, not necessarily what we call a verb in the terminology of grammar. Let's look at and listen to that sentence again. The most beautiful of our tutors, Jane, is very clever and always teaches clearly and very effectively. The word most is an adverb attached to the adjective beautiful and producing what is known as the superlative form of the adjective, just as the adverb more is added to an adjective to make the comparative form when you are comparing two people or things, as in the sentence, Jane is more beautiful than Julia. Though, of course, many comparative adjectives are made by adding the suffix er to the adjective, as in cleverer, and superlatives are often made by adding the suffix est, as in cleverest. And we've just met another useful term that you'll find in the course, suffix. It's at the other end of a word from a prefix. A prefix is fixed to the front, a suffix is fixed to the back. Adverbs are commonly made by adding the suffix ly, as you've just seen and heard in the word commonly. In our sentence, we have the common form of adverb with the ly suffix in clearly and effectively, which are called adverbs of manner, because they tell us the manner in which the action of the verb teaches, that is to say the teaching, is carried out. Another adverb attached to the verb teaches is always, an adverb of time, 
telling us when the action is performed. Then there's the adverb very, which is attached to the adjective clever, and to the adverb effectively. It's akin to the comparative and superlative adverbs more and most, and is generally known as an adverb of degree, indicating the degree of Jane's cleverness, or of the effectiveness of her teaching. Similar adverbs of degree are barely, slightly, rather, increasingly, extremely, more, and less. Read and listen to a sentence stuffed with them. John, being barely awake and feeling rather stupid, became extremely agitated as he increasingly realised how extremely drunk he had been more or less all evening. You will also observe that the same word can sometimes act as an adjective or an adverb. For example, if we say more people or less money, the words more and less are adjectives. But if we say the more educated people or the less sound money, they are adverbs qualifying the adjectives educated and sound, respectively. We find a similar change of function with the words this and that. If we say, for example, who is this or what is that, the words this and that are demonstrative pronouns. But if we say, who is this man or what is that object, they are demonstrative adjectives, defining the noun man and object respectively. But we had something new in our sentence about drunken John's rude awakening to the reality of his behaviour the previous night. It was the participle being. A participle is a kind of verbal adjective. It combines the nature of both verb and adjective. In the opening phrase, John being barely awake, the participle being is like an adjective in being attached to the noun John, while also retaining the properties of a verb, having as its complement the normal kind of adjective, awake. In action verbs, which can have objects, we find that the participle keeps this ability too. Listen to John on the horns of a dilemma. Loving Julia and Jane equally, John didn't know which one to propose to. The present participle, loving, has the objects, Julia and Jane, just as though we had used the basic verb and said, John loved Julia and Jane equally. Participles are also used in compound verbs, especially in the continuous rather than the simple verb forms, as in, I am coming, or he is killing himself with work. And there are past participles too, of course, as in the following sentences. Having come and found no one at home, I went away again. Having loved and lost Lucy, he was not going to get emotionally entangled so deeply again. Brought up wisely and educated well, and having studied English speech and pronunciation, she enjoyed great success in life. The stick was bent and twisted. And note how in this last little sentence the past participles bent and twisted from the verbs to bend and twist respectively are used simply as adjectives. We shall find cases where this difference of use affects pronunciation. Now let's have another little quiz, bringing in the other parts of speech we looked at since our last one. Listen to the following sentence. John and Jane, who, having good qualifications and experience, are already the best tutors in their college, are going to be promoted, but only after more and more difficult examinations. We'll give you a series of screens showing this sentence, with certain words highlighted, and you must say what part of speech they are. Verbs, proper nouns, adjectives, or whatever. Get ready now for the first screen.
John and Jane are proper nouns, and so in this sentence is college. For although the noun does not give the name of the college, it is for them the college, their own proprietary one, the one that is proper to them, and they spell it with a capital letter. are in the second line and are going to be promoted in the third line are verbs. The one in the third line being a very long compound verb. Having in the first line and going and promoted in the third line are participles. The two in the third line, going and promoted, join with forms of the verb to be, are and to be, to make the big compound verb are going to be promoted. The words in and after are prepositions. Good, best, which is the superlative degree of good, and the word more at the end of the third line are adjectives. Note that the first more, the one at the end of the third line, qualifies the noun examinations, whereas the second more qualifies the adjective difficult and is therefore an adverb. They have to do more examinations and those examinations will be more difficult. Already, only, and, as you heard a moment ago, the word more in the last line, qualifying the adjective difficult, are adverbs. Who and there are pronouns. Who is a relative pronoun relating to the proper nouns or names John and Jane. There is a possessive pronoun telling us whose college it is, who it belongs to. It is their college, the college of John and Jane. The is the definite article. The two ands and but are conjunctions. Tutors and examinations are common nouns. That brings us to the end of our brief introduction to English grammar. 
we may in the future produce further 45 minute film tutorials to go into the subject more deeply and to deal with the many common mistakes that cause embarrassment, ambiguity and, on occasions, incomprehension. But, as we pointed out earlier, grammar is only a means, not an end. The end we strive for is first-class communication skills in the language which is not only ours, but the main international language. An immensely subtle, beautiful and intricate language that at its best is perhaps the most perfect form of human communication the world has ever known. Don't believe those politically correct fools who tell you that it is what you say that matters and not how you say it. You could be clever, highly qualified in your studies or profession, hard-working, and well-dressed. But if you cannot speak and communicate fluently and attractively and correctly, you can fail to achieve your aspirations and the positions you otherwise deserve. Moreover, the fact that English has become the main international language, flattering though it is, has made for many difficult the English spoken by some other nations has become such a strong dialect that it is sometimes barely comprehensible to other English speakers elsewhere and thus defeats the whole purpose of having a common international language. Almost every country in the world has its standard form of pronunciation of its own language, which is usually the speech of the educated people of the capital city and which is the most universally comprehensible within countries which often have many very different and difficult dialects. In the case of English, the standard form is known as the Received Pronunciation, or RP for short. And because English is not only a national but the main international language, it is important to learn this if you want to be understood and respected everywhere. Whether English is your first or a second language, you will find RP the key to success, both professionally and socially. But let's use our all on film methods to show you what we mean. It's the same in all walks of life. You can have the most brilliant qualifications and CV only to find that you are not getting where you want and deserve to be because your speech and accent are letting you down. Listen to some typical comments presented by our actors. The sort of comments heard every day affecting people's careers and whole lives. She's a lovely girl, but intelligent too. Mm, until she opens her mouth. That new foreign doctor you saw looked very nice, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. That smart young fellow we recruited for the bank recently would go far if only he could speak better. I learned RP to give myself the best chance in my interview. My whole career depended on it. We were doing a lot of business in Britain and I needed to speak well and confidently when I went over to give top level presentations and negotiate contracts. I'm a science teacher and I was astonished and delighted that the respect I got from my students and the rather envious admiration of my colleagues after I'd learned to speak fluently with a good accent and without making mistakes. Curtain call ten minutes, Sir Robert. They taught pronunciation at drama school, but my RP was still too shaky. My vowels were unreliable 
and I kept failing in auditions for parts I really wanted. I didn't want to do low-life parts all my life. I have my own English language school in my hometown. Almost every child in Greece takes private English lessons to supplement what they learn or don't learn at school. I had all the paper qualifications, could read and write English almost perfectly, knew and could tell all the grammar, but my accent wasn't good. We use totally different, very flat mouth shapes in Greek, you know. But since I learned RP, I never looked back. I shot ahead of all my local competitors, I charged twice as much, and I'm still turning applicants away. I sailed through all my law exams with flying colours, but I didn't get far in my career until I changed my accent and learned to speak good RP. Then I really took off. Whatever your job or profession, it's a competitive world. And if you do our English speech and pronunciation course, you'll give yourself a real competitive edge. To learn more about the unique, all on film, English speech and pronunciation course, please visit our website, where you'll be able to buy it securely online. It could be the best investment in your future success, self-confidence and happiness that you will ever make. www.speechandpronunciation.com Good health and good luck.